whale community and welcome to another episode of the metaverse makers movers and shakers we are so excited today to be here with david cash 888 who is an amazing creative who's working internationally in you know the entertainment industry in the nft space and this is such a treat for us to have you here david how are you today Thank you for having me. I'm great. I'm great. We just got that lo-fi hip hop moment. I'm feeling good. We're off to a good start. Yeah. Uh, from uh, not so sunny Toronto, Canada. How are you doing? <laughs> I am doing well. Thank you. Yes, I'm in uh, Cleveland currently. It's also not so sunny, but it's okay. We're going to make the most of it. Yes. <laughs> yes. We will bring the sunshine here instead. Absolutely. So tell us, I think, you know, one of the biggest things in the whale community is learning about the crypto space, the NFT space, and kind of the journey that folks have taken and how they've been able to take their passions and their talents in, you know, kind of the traditional real world and bring them into the metaverse. So tell us, you know, how, how have you got here in the metaverse? What has your journey been like? For sure. Um, so I always like to start by mentioning that, like, uh, before I really got, like, deep into NFTs or crypto or anything, I was investing in crypto just as a like a hobbyist i guess i bought bitcoin in 2014 um because i was a kid very into like the non-movement etc so i wanted to like get into that i wanted to like experience the web in its fullest so in 2014 i bought bitcoin um and then in 2019 um a little company called makers place reached out to me because i was a i was a photographer uh and i ran a production company so they reached out to me um asking me to make tokenized art on the internet and i was like what is that <laughs> so I, I minted a couple i didn't really get super into it um because i was really busy for for about six years i ran a production company in toronto uh, we did some work in la we did some work in new york um a little bit in europe uh and we did it, it was mainly photo video production um but we did a lot of like fringe media too so like we did work for like netflix and ovo and every time they had like a weird new device like um twitch did a partnership with ovo and they sent over like a live streaming backpack so I'm the person they call being like, how do we use this? <laughs> so that was me for a few years. And then I was doing pretty much all my work on set. Um, and then COVID happened, um, of course, uh, beginning of last year. Oh. And so I had to do something else. <laughs> so I decided to, I never thought I would do this, but I decided to go back to school and do a master's degree. Um, I did my master's in art direction, but it was in Italy and it was with Vogue Italia. It was quite an interesting program. It was very open-ended. So you could essentially do your final two projects, like your thesis, and this magazine project on anything that you wanted. And wow. I started getting like back into NFTs um, at the beginning of you know, 20, 2019, 2020. I was like still kind of dabbling in this space. So I was interested and I started understanding more and more about like Web3 and what the future is going to look like in terms of the space. So I started writing a thesis and I wrote a 180 page thesis on NFTs de and decentralization as an anthropological device is what I called it. Um, but we talked a lot about the metaverse. We talked a lot about virtual fashion. Uh, talked a ton about NFTs and what the future in terms of like this world is going to look like. And that very much launched me, I would say, into the space. Um, over the past few months, I think 40,000 people have read it um, just as a free document on the internet. Um, we can plug that in a moment. I have it still. I have a version of it on one of my websites. So the people, it's still free. I still give it away uh, very much in that open source mindset. Um, and then, yeah, and then one thing very quickly led to another. Um, I was working with the people at NFTS.tips, um, one of the largest NFT communities. Um, on Clubhouse and started doing some work with them. Um, I helped them found their editorial team, um, which was a like a group of writers that we came together about four or five months ago, um, near the beginning of this year. And since then, we've taken on a few different clients, um, the first of which was um, actually how I ended up connecting with Whale Shark properly, which is uh, Jamie at Outlier Ventures. Um, they started a publication called NFTS.WTF. Um, and they asked me first, I was just doing some writing for them. And then they asked me to be their editor in chief. So that's how that kind of progressed. And then since then, it's just been kind of madness. Um, I'm working on probably about 20 NFT drops at any given time. Um, I had to start a consultancy here in Canada to like, consolidate all of this crypto business that I was doing uh, and am doing. And uh, yeah, it's been it's been a really amazing journey. I've worked with a lot of art galleries. I'm on the personal team of a lot of uh, lovely NFT artists who I'm sure a lot of the community know and love. Um, and yeah, now I'm, I'm working full time in NFTs and crypto. My 100% of my income is in crypto. And uh, I love it. I love it. I really enjoy this space every day, um, exploring the metaverse, exploring Web3, um, exploring wearables in virtual fashion. Uh, this has very much um, become my wheelhouse. And it's interesting, as per your point, um, how 
if I didn't run a production company for six years, like regardless of how successful that was, I don't think I would have the bandwidth or the ability to produce the projects that I'm doing today. So, you know, everything happens for a reason, but here we are now. <laughs> right. And it like, it is amazing what I've seen, you know, with folks kind of jumping from, you know, the rest of the world to the metaverse in a full-time capacity like you've done is the large number of them. And I, I give the disclaimer, you know, working at Dapper Labs. So like I'm on the team working with NBA Top Shot, Crypto Kitties, and like the people that are there all had very interesting journeys before they even got into crypto and were like, look, like now I've taken the things that I was formerly trained in, but also the random stuff I was doing as a hobby and like created this like amalgamation of like new job criteria that has really made kind of everything possible because they're in the metaverse aren't limits. Like there's not, you know, this set formula and a roadmap that you have to follow because we're literally paving the way in the space here. And that's that's one of the things that really excites me. Like as a, when I as a director, I say when I was a director, but I still do some. I do direct projects still. But um, I was always interested in doing something that hadn't been done before or like wasn't possible. So the metaverse just opens up a whole new world of opportunities. Um, I work with apps like Superworld uh, and different metaverses like Oasis, um, and you can just do literally anything, and it's really fun. Like from a creative standpoint, that you that you have no limitations. Uh, you can literally just do whatever you could possibly imagine. Right. And that's what you're saying, you know, because you've got, you know, the wearables that are, you know, a thing that people have been creating. And, you know, it kind of takes, obviously, people's love of fashion and then converts it to something that is, you know, more of a commodity because you can have it in game. You can have it, you know, in an unlike traditional gaming where it's in one space and you're stuck. Like now you can take it literally everywhere with you and create that persona, you know, kind of around the things that you have. And, that's kind of magical, but that's not even, I would say, like, that's not the end of it because there's so much more that can still be developed that folks haven't even thought of yet. Totally. Um, I had a conversation with um, DressX, Natalia from DressX yesterday, um, and she mentioned something that that just reminded me of. Uh, she was saying how, like, until we actually reach a point where we have a metaverse and all of us have, like, one avatar that can switch between all these little verses, um, we are our avatar. So like AR and VR, like augmenting our current form is what we have until that point. So I thought that was super interesting. So I just thought I'd interject with that. It really is. Like yeah. it, these are the things that like I end up like sitting up at night just like thinking about it at three in the morning. Cause I was like, it's right. such a deep rabbit hole. Totally. Oh my goodness. And so tell me about, I guess, some of the stuff that you've been doing with I there's so much that you've been doing. Um so I guess we'll start with your cash labs that I own. I'm going to share that on the screen because this is your consultancy. Um, so what does that look like when totally. you're so, you know, running a consultancy? When like I mentioned this, I always like to just like start with, and I'm sure a lot of people are in this position. It went from me just like researching this space a lot to like every day people were just asking me questions about this all day. Like I realized I was on phone calls, just like onboarding people and teaching people what NFTs were like every day. And I was like, okay, this is great, but I can't just do this for free forever. Um, I have to figure out what I'm doing. And then I started asking for um, money, <laughs> I suppose, right. to put it like super bluntly. Um, and people were very receptive to that. So that was how it really started. I mean, I never thought I would be a consultant, um, but it is kind of like when you reach a point of um, like niche expertise in a couple different spaces, like I have this production background and then I have NFTs. So in terms of like producing NFT projects, it comes very natively to me because it's really like creating an ad campaign, but like a really niche Web3 ad campaign. So that's very much what we do with Cash Labs. I haven't updated the website fully, um, but like one of the things I always like to mention on this website is you see that white button um, at the bottom, just the read my thesis. free book. Yeah, so this is a version of my thesis that I've been giving away for free for the past few months. So I'm sure most of the people in the whale community are very well aware of pretty much everything in this book. Um, but this is like my onboarding. I say like, send it to your grandma, send it to your mom, dog walker, whoever, um, who wants to get into NFTs. Cause like, this is also one of my responses to getting so many questions. I was like, okay, like, let me just give you a resource where it's all in one place. You don't have to go. Cause I mean, we've all done our rabbit holes of Googling and YouTube. Uh, in this space to try to figure out what's a liquidity pool, what's staking, like all of these like very niche aspects of the space, um, which eventually become very native. But when you're when you're first going through it, I think it's a little bit um, scary. <laughs> so that's why I did this. I did a very I made it a very interactive document. It's not just like a thesis. 
like just like a white page. Like there's a lot of moving images. There's a lot of videos. Um, so yeah, that's that's what I did there. And uh, and then the thing I need to add to this is like lately it's been quite interesting. Um, some of the jobs that I've gotten to do through this um, through this project, uh, I recently got a chance to. I'm working with Krista Kim is one of the people I'm working with regularly. So we have a project coming up later. Uh, this week, I can talk about a little bit later. Um, we and then partnering with Krista, we started doing a whole bunch of different things. We did the first uh, NFT for the NBA through my consultancy in collaboration with her studio. Uh, that was for the Utah Jazz, so that was like the first ever, like I guess, proper affiliated sports NFT with NBA. Um, and then uh, we also recently did. Well, I, I I ran lead on it, but we did an NFT drop for French Montana, um, his first uh, NFT. Um, and we're doing a few other like secret, I guess, celebrity NFTs that I'm under NDAs for. Um, but yeah, and then here's a few of the different clients that uh, we work with um, very regularly um, and just some like key links. So um, nice. yeah, I guess we can go over any elements of that. But there's there's a lot um, going on in terms of uh, Cash Labs. I mean, it feels like even though it's a much newer company, it's only been around for like six to eight months. Like I'd say 90 percent of my deal flow goes through this versus my production company, which is a which is a bit of a shift. But I'm really enjoying everything that I'm doing. So, uh, yeah, it's been a great awesome. journey. And we actually had a couple questions from chat that I think cool. relate to where you're, you know, at with your consultancy. The first one and most recent, um, Iliscavi is wondering if as a consultancy, you advise beyond NFTs. Yes. So my business is registered in the government as a blockchain and fine art consultancy because I needed to find out some way to consolidate what I do into like a legal terminology. Um, but I'd say it goes pretty far beyond that. Um, I would say we're more of like a Web3 consultancy. So anything under that umbrella. So like XR, AR, VR, the metaverse, um, wearables. Um, stealing a page out of Whale Shark's book, he said something that I always like repeat <laughs> and I give him credit for it. But he says he's a use case maximalist. And I was like, oh, I relate to that so much. Um, like getting utility or getting value out of something was always something I tried to perpetuate with the content that I created. So now that I can do it as a more 360 project where there's like a product offering, and then like an experience, a user experience throughout that and like architecting that user experience, I find that really fun. So I'd say like NFTs are just the tip of the iceberg. Um, I always say that like NFTs are the buzzword. Once you like dive in again through that rabbit hole, um, there's so much more that you kind of like open the door for, open the door through. Um, and yeah, it's uh, I'd say that it's the differentiation between web two and web three is really like where I'm um, excelling or having a lot of fun with because once you integrate finance into this part of the internet, um, like I said, you can really create these like 360 product offerings that are more experiential than practical, if that makes sense. It, it really is. And that's something that I think, you know, especially as the pandemic happened last year, you know, the rest of the world stopped like this really just the whole scene exploded because you know, I didn't have to say this for the last year, but like people needed a space where they could still continue their normal life, those social interactions, and it just happened to convert to the metaverse. And so trying to fit everybody's lives into the metaverse in such a short time, like it has created such a boom for us, you know, trying to build here. And it's almost impossible for people to keep up with. I, I wrote about this a lot in my thesis, like how we um, transitioned as a society towards this so quickly. And obviously the pandemic is a big uh, perpetuation of like this kind of mentality. Um, but one thing I always mention is like hypermodernity, this idea, this like this like kind of inflated term <laughs> of hypermodernity, which basically just means that we've reached a point in society where technology is developing too fast for us to comprehend in total in full. Like it's impossible to understand every single coding language, every single thing that's happening 100%. Um, so, and it will continue to exponentially increase, right? Like eventually it's going to be fully impossible for us to know everything, uh, in a space. So I like to kind of consolidate, <laughs> um, and like, uh, I guess reassure people that just because they don't understand it and it seems foreign, like this space, web three NFTs, whatever, um, not to be scared. It's just because we've had such crazy exponential growth in the past 10, 20 years. I mean, like the first, what I, what I cited is the first example of like proper decentralization was like the idea of the um, digital nomad, which came about in the 90s, 2000s, when people were traveling around with their laptops and working from anywhere. And that was really like a like a, like a a foreign idea, at least when it started, like what, you're gonna go do your work in Bali? Like, who are you? But now it's like celebrated as this kind of, uh, you know, solopreneur, um, you know, self-starter, like this is, a di this is now an ideal. And that's happened only in the past 20 years. And I'd say like, it's a full societal shift. Um, and I definitely think we're going to see more of it. And I 
hundred percent agree with you. I think that that's something like watching this, you know, cause it was something I grew up in the late eighties, early nineties. So like, this has always been kind of a thing that I've been growing up with. And so like the evolution opens so many doors. We have another question from the chat asking what you believe is the biggest pain point for legacy businesses as they migrate into web three enabled worlds. That's a very good question. Uh, and I deal with this a lot. Um, I'd say there's a few like key elements. One of them is obviously like onboarding. Everybody wants a credit card on board right now, especially in terms of bigger companies and celebrities. Um, I like to push the route of education first. Like I would much prefer all of their audience members get a MetaMask and learn how that works. <laughs> but sometimes that is a big pain point where they're like, no, our audience will not be receptive to this. So it's actually interesting how I find a lot of big companies are open to NFTs because it's such a buzzword and they're so like popular right now, but they're not interested in crypto. So it, and it's, that's kind of a contradiction. So I have to have a lot of like long talks with companies about that kind of uh, eccentricity <laughs> or that system. Um, and then also I would say um, KYC constantly comes up, like know your customer constantly comes up and AML, all these things um, when you're dealing with legacy companies or like Fortune 500s or like celebrities, because they have these systems in place with like data mining and like email lists and CRM and all these things. And they, it's very difficult for them to come out of that. Um, I do see a lot of KYC happening in different crypto sites. Um, but at the same time, it kind of, while it's necessary in some specific situations for, I guess, like tax purposes, et cetera, it does kind of go against the whole decentralization um, world that we're trying to build here. So it's, it's always a pain point when I talk, I'd say like those two things, like the credit card onboard, like KYC, like pretty much every time comes up. <laughs> I agree. And honestly, I think those things are so related because with the credit card onboarding, like you're involving finance. So having right. the KYC and like any of those, you know, not just the taxation, but fraud and AML, like those are, you know, something that is, you know, the decentralization right now, like the metaverse is kind of the wild west. So navigating that and finding a way to keep people and companies safe, like that's, I've, I think, going to be a very long and interesting. Yeah, I think the from a lot of corporate folks still look at uh, Web3 as like the dark web. And we've moved so much beyond that. And I remember the dark web fondly. <laughs> like I actually quite liked it, but I'm not really on it anymore because now we have Web3 uh, enabled websites on the surface web. And there's so much that we can do now um, through DeFi. But like as per the previous point, I feel like a lot of these companies are, I'm calling it like CDFI, like centralized decentralized finance. Because yes, they're going through decentralized routes. Like, yeah, they take ETH, but a lot of them are like going out of the way. And I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing because it does help adoption. But at the same time, they're going through, they're going to like really extensive lengths just to add a credit card onboarding, which then brings a whole suite of problems along with it. So I think it's a, it's an interesting um, anomaly. And we're, it's, just, it's very like uh, telling us to where we are in the space right now. We're very much still in this transitionary period, I think. Yes. And, and it'll be interesting to watch that progression as we move forward. We had another question actually too about your consultancy. And I know we have a lot of other things that we can cover, but the last one, People wanted to know if they can actually present their projects to you and your team to get feedback. So things like roadmaps, yes. art marketing, you know, if you're interested in working together, how would they go about doing that? So uh, we are booking into 2022, which is, we're very blessed to say, but it's also the end of the year. So I mean, go figure. Um, but that being said, uh, once a week, I do a two hour long clubhouse room every Friday um, called Cash Labs Pitch Your NFT Project. It's on nfts.tips uh, on Clubhouse. And I reserve two hours a week, literally just to have people pitch me their projects and give feedback on them, answer questions, because otherwise I'm super busy and I rarely find time to do so. So yeah, twice a week on nfts.tips, uh, Fridays, 4 to 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, if you're interested. So yeah, nfts.tips is uh, is uh, one of the larger clubhouse communities, especially I think the largest NFT clubhouse community. It's either them or Amir. So <laughs> um, yeah, and then Amir's not on clubhouse anymore, but still <laughs> all right so i'm gonna post that in the chat here with the well, thank link you. for pitching ideas we've got the site up sharing that and so that's really exciting having the ability for the community to interact with you and yeah. your learnings i like you know i also i teach at a few different universities now on this topic um, so I really do like sharing information. I think like that's one of the main things of like this open source space is like I wouldn't know anything in like in terms of this space if people weren't really open with me when things started. People on YouTube, people on Clubhouse, 
people willing to pick up the phone and just talk to me for a few hours. So I think also that's why when I started in the space, I was way receptive to doing that. Like I had definitely like three to five hour phone calls, like onboarding people. And I was like, wait a second, this is not sustainable, but it's great. <laughs> I still recommend that people do it. Well, and, and have you found when you're having calls like that, um, that you end up learning nearly as much as you're you know, kind of sharing? With yeah, I find I, I now know like probably a hundred different ways to set up a wallet or to fund yourself with crypto. So I mean, that's useful because everybody's in a different state or province or country with different laws and different regulations. You know, something that's easy for me may be impossible for you. So, yeah, I think it's just finding like uh, different methods to do the same thing, which I'm discovering there are a lot of. So, yes, yeah. yes, that makes troubleshooting people's uh, questions hard sometimes because I'm like, I haven't even seen that process. So you have to walk me <laughs> They're through. They're like, what about this wallet? I'm like, I don't know how you found a wallet I haven't heard of, but bravo. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. So totally with you there, too. Um, so looking at you know this nfts.tips it looks like there are a lot of different things happening here we've got events and meetups you've got the resources the services like this is an amazing resource for the community totally actually. so um tip, i can give like a tiny bit of background tips started um was founded by alexander Mazze on uh, clubhouse um they started an official company um, glassy music and everybody has uh, interesting names in this space as you know uh, glassy music and alex started an official foundation um, and through that they created um, a number of project teams so you'll see there's a ton of different things um, that tips does um, so i was the founder of the editorial team there's a curation team there's a social good team there's a events team uh, there's an architecture team like a metaverse architecture team so there's all these different verticals and each one is like a team of people interested in that thing um, and some of them are profitable. So like our editorial team is profitable. We've made several hundred thousand dollars in the past few months and um, given jobs to, I think, over 100 writers in the crypto space. So that's something very exciting. And like I'd say tips is definitely the facilitation uh, mechanism of that and these uh, different projects because it's how we all met. It's how we all came together, um, at least in those specific communities, because in, uh, in like January, February of this year, um, and even December of last year, I think like people were starved trying to figure out like, who can I talk to about this? Like, obviously it's getting really big and people are paying attention, but where do I go to talk about this? So like, I tried talking about it in class. Nobody knew what the hell I was talking about. So then I moved to Clubhouse and that's how I found tips. And that's how I found um, a lot of my people, people I still speak to every day now. And uh, yeah, so I, and then I'm, it's funny cause I'm going to be meeting a lot of them. Um, I'm going to LA next month and I'm going to NFT NYC uh, in November. And I'm going to meet a lot of these people, but I've never met them before in real life. So it's interesting. Um, feels very much like the early days of social media because I was very much involved in like some of those early live stream maps and stuff. But it's fun. It's a totally, totally new world. Um, and, and Clubhouse was definitely a big perpetuation of that. Like without Clubhouse, I don't know how we would have all met. So it's interesting. Right. And that's such an interesting thing when you think about it too, because finding these people, you know, that you now have these legitimate connections with and you're like, all right, like I already know you. So now I'm just- like I know their kids. I know their wives. I know, like, I know like their whole right. family. It's like, yeah. You know, I- you know, it's funny because my mom for years, you know, had been telling me, she's like, I'm concerned about your social life. And I'm like, I spend a lot of time online. I have a social life. It's fine. You just don't see them. And she's like, no, yeah. no, like I, you need friends. And I'm like, I have so many, like too these, many friends. <laughs> right. Like I, I was like, I can't explain to you like how important these communities are and how well I know the people in them. And so, you know, seeing this now, you know, because as you mentioned, you know, there are these IRL meetups, you go into NFT, NYC, and like, so that puts like, you know, an actual physical form to the person that you already know. And it breaks those traditional barriers of what people assumed, you know, connection could be. Totally. Totally. And that is, that is one of the mechanisms of decentralization, like at play, the fact that we can have relationships, regardless of location, I think are, is really exciting. I love that so much. So like I, I keep pointing at things like this now and I'm like, I told you so, like this is happening. I was just early years ago. It's fine. Right. Like, I predicted it. It was, yeah, you know. <laughs> right. Like we're totally okay there. Um, let's see. We had a question actually earlier in the chat, kind of going back to when you were talking about the fashion designers, um, what is would you suggest is the best way to acclimate, you know, folks like fashion designers into NFTs? Because, you know, as you were mentioning, you know, you'd much prefer people get a meta mask and actually understand the decentralization side of things. Um, but for, you know, people to get in and actually create NFTs, they need to know more than just meta mask, you know, whether it's, you know, 
the NFTs themselves, like which platforms you're building on, which standards you're using, like how how are you finding, you know, pulling people into the metaverse is, you know, given those types of struggles? No, it's a great question. I mean, there's two sides of this because so like one is I, I have the pleasure of working with like, in my opinion, like the best virtual fashion brands in the world. Um, I've worked with, you know, uh, Fabricant, DressX, doing talks right now with Artifact, like some really incredible companies. But I'd say that's very much on the virtual side. Um, but actually, funny enough, one of the first things that really clicked to me in terms of like use cases for NFTs, like in 2019, like I'd say like late 2019, um, is the fashion component. And I was, I had a, I had a like a lunch, and there were a couple like big um, folks from different fashion companies. And we were just talking about like the future of digital, and NFTs came up, and. I'd say it's one of the first use cases that made like 100% sense to me um, because if you're selling luxury items, they already come with so much certification. Like if you buy a Prada bag, you get a card, you get a letter, you get something sent to you in the mail. You have all of this stuff um, and all of that could be facilitated or replaced by an NFT in a more secure manner. So like the first thing that made sense to me in terms of NFTs was the ultimate means of digital certification. And then when I understood the secondary market aspect of them, then I was like, oh, shoot. I don't know if I can say shit, but I did. There you go. Um, but uh, yeah, it was just like, it was just like a, like a aha moment for me. And I was like, oh, so Gucci could sell a, like a sweater and 30 years down the line, they don't need to track that down. They know who owns it. And for companies that do like archival, like obviously art galleries, you know, they try to get back pieces after some time uh, once they're super valuable, like Christie's, Sotheby's. That's why I think it made sense to them quite early. Um, but also in the fashion world, um, there are huge archives of vintage pieces from specific eras and they're not even sold. They're just collected. But if we can have a means to document every piece being sold accurately and securely, um, in an open source ledger, it's just, it was just that that was my aha moment. So for me, fashion is one of the most like, um, logical use cases for NFTs. And I think that's why we see a lot of fashion brands already. And I do say already, cause it still is early, but like Dolce & Gabbana, Burberry, Gucci, like some of these huge brands already embracing NFTs because I think it just makes sense. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. and as you mentioned, you know, having already, you know, coming with things like those cards, this paperwork, having the certifications, like it makes a lot of sense that you would have sure. ways to it's validate cheaper. authenticity. Yeah. Baseline, like for a company that's looking at the bottom line, okay, they have to pay a gas fee, but they're not paying for like thousands of cards to be printed in plastic, like with serial numbers and all of these things, like right. super different. Yeah, and, and I would say, like, arguably, it's probably easier to, you know, fabricate a card than it would be a blockchain transaction. So, you know, it kind of depends helps. for who, but yes, <laughs> right. Well, so, so like, arguably, like, there are some exceptions, I'm sure. But at this point, at this point, I mint stuff way too fast because I have to do it for clients almost every day. So for me now, minting is just like, doop doop doop. <laughs> it's just a really fast process. Yeah, and then, and I know that that's something that you know has always been since I joined the space, you know, one of the biggest, you know, theoretical, like, look, we could make it so, you know, you're not able to do, you know, the forgeries and, you know, you, you definitely have a way to track, you know, the, the source of the transaction, you know, totally. if it was the, you know, official wallet that minted. There's so many times with clients that like, if it wasn't on the blockchain, like there may have been issues because, you know, you have to triple check a price of something, one specific transaction, I just go to my ether scan. I look at my entire history. I don't need to take screenshots. I don't need to take notes. It's all there for me. It's just for, for a practitioner, if like once you've done it a bunch of times, it becomes, and I'm definitely preaching to the choir here with a lot of people watching, but it becomes really easy. Like it really does. So I enjoy That's it. Amazing too, you know, cause even being able to download the transactions, like then you've got all your records right there. Like it's accessible and it makes it so much easier for any sort of business tracking. Totally. Totally. And I love it. I'm trying to find, there's also like, um, what is it? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Coin tracker. Also like now, um, every transaction that I do is automatically logged by this shameless plug. I do not work for these people. I just really enjoy their product. Um, coin tracker is okay. a way that I, I have all my wallets linked, like all the public keys in my wallets linked to this app. And it tracks all of my crypto exchange and income, like all of my crypto trades and income. Um, so that when it comes to pay taxes, it's again, it's just download CSV file. So like there are a lot of these dApps being created right now, which like if you implement them, they just fully make your life easier. <laughs> like yes. taxes have always been a pain point for me. So that's just amazing that I can just, you know, two clicks. Here's my record. Yeah. 
that is definitely helpful because that's something that I think a lot of people have been asking as they start to get more and more enmeshed in the metaverse and in the crypto space. And they're like, how do I track these? And the government obviously has been more and more interested in what we're doing as well. Oh, yeah. Um, which actually kind of brings us to a question that somebody had. Esoteric asks, um, if potential business partners, so people that are not yet in the space, are becoming more concerned about the legal requirements to operate in the space, uh, specifically if Canadian government is more progressive in its views than, say, the SEC here. So um, I'd say it's kind of a loaded question because, like, is Canada more liberal in terms of crypto? Yes, um, for a couple key specific reasons. But um, generally speaking, I do still think the sentiment from governments and banks is um, erring on the side of caution, unfortunately. And I've had a lot. Of, I'm the one. I'll call my bank, wait till I can get to a manager and be like, look, you guys just blocked my card because I tried to buy like $50 of Bitcoin. Can you give me a break? Like, seriously, like I'm going to be doing this for the next forever. So like just either get used to it or I'm going to be calling you a lot. Um, so I'd say in terms of regulation um, from banks, I'd say it's pretty uh, across the board. But I do know that certain countries are getting crypto banned altogether. Um, I do foresee a little bit of our dark web past coming back up just to go around that as countries kind of figure this out. Um, but I think it still boils to back down to that conversation we had about um, like AML KYC. And I'd say that's one of the main uh, responses that I'm noticing from companies um, to all of these uh, regulations, et cetera, is they just want to do it super above board, super by the book. Um, but it's difficult because there is no real book, right? There is no like, um, they, so these are the rules. This is what you're supposed to do every time you do a crypto transaction, uh, internationally, especially. So um, I'd say regulations are still very much in the early days. But at the same time, um, interestingly, interestingly enough, I still think that the hype around NFTs right now um, trumps, and I hate using the word trumps, but trumps the fear um, from a lot of companies. Because I've even seen companies, like we worked with the Utah Jazz, and um, they're doing this like metaverse love virtual locker room where people can meet players in this virtual locker room and they were um there was some kind of scare about them getting fined for the nba from the nba for something um i forgot exactly what it was maybe i shouldn't say exactly what it was but i don't remember so that's perfect um and then the founder um or the the owner of the utah jazz basically said how much is the fine and they're like twenty thousand dollars and he said eh, whatever and like we need more people to do that just to kind of push through this uh awkward transitionary period it's like we're in the puberty stage of uh, crypto. <laughs> like it's still these growing pains. It's still people aren't hundred percent sure what to do. Um, but a lot of people are very confident. And I always say like when people aren't ready, or at least if they don't seem ready to start crypto, I just say like literally sign up for a Coinbase or something or like buy $50 of any crypto, leave it, come back in a year and then just see it. And then I don't need to tell you anything. <laughs> like I don't need to explain anything to you. Like you'll see what's going on firsthand. So yes. if people aren't ready now, just tell them to send them, send them $10 in Bitcoin or send them $10 in ETH and just tell them to check back up on it in a year. And that's like the best convincing you can possibly do. <laughs> yes, that's, you know, and, and I will say that I think that the recent, you know, the last year or so, like the extra media coverage that both, you know, crypto itself and the NFT space has gotten has really turned the tide for a lot of folks who yeah. My parents included. They say there's no bad that, press, but I mean, damn. <laughs> right? they, my, I would say my parents were like not interested in for years, you know, because it started in 2018, like the beginning. And they were like, I don't understand what you're doing and explaining it doesn't help. And suddenly I've got my mom texting me about Dogecoin because she saw it on the news. And like that, you know, and then they started seeing NBA Top Shot on the news. And then they were like, okay, so like, yeah. what is it that you do? And I'm like, I've been telling you, you know. So my dad's like following crypto, like the stock market and that shift, like that's, that's huge. huge. Um, it's it's actually really funny because it's a it's the same kind of shift. Like my mom's bought Ethereum and Bitcoin with me, but my dad refuses still to buy Bitcoin, but he's invested in multiple NFTs. So it's just kind of, it's still we're in this like interesting period. Like he's understood NFTs, but he doesn't understand crypto, which is like fully the fundamentals. So it's, it's interesting. We're still in that, uh, that stage, that growing stage. Right. Yeah. And it'll be interesting, I think, as we get more of those folks onboarded into the space, you know, at those various learning curves, obviously. But, you know, that's something that we're trying to do here in the whale community. And obviously, in a lot of the different organizations that you're working with, you know, kind of getting people onboarded and understanding the fundamentals so that way they can kind of move forward and 
excel in the space. It really is. We're still in this onboarding phase. And that's also like, I never pattern myself after being a teacher or like a professor or anything like that. But I'm, I am teaching at universities, like doing like one of course or short courses, specifically on NFTs, the metaverse and DeFi, because I see it as really worthwhile. If I can onboard 2000 people in one go versus one on one, that's just efficient. <laughs> so yes. that's why I'm doing it. That is. And we had an interesting question um, to kind of change the um, subject a little bit. Manju said, asked um, if there's a tactic you suggest to larger brands who are concerned about giving too much power to their customers when it comes to creating art or opportunities that might dilute the company's market strength or their bottom line. So, you know, we've seen with, you know, Web3 kind of the rise of individual creators and that obviously, you know, we've, we've seen a lot of individuals here ahead of the big brands. So how are we going to, I think, so, move folks in? I think space? it's interesting because like as a community, we're very attuned to like the board ape type projects, right? Like projects with derivative rights, um, have kind of become a staple of like the community's space, like this like degen mentality. Like I'm gonna buy this and I can do whatever I want with it. Um, I think the shift that's happening now as more companies get into the space is that's kind of leaving <laughs> the the system, uh, unfortunately, at least like a part of it. Um, so like when you see somebody like the NBA or if you see somebody like a like a fashion designer, they don't want you subverting their designs. They don't want you changing their clothing. Um, so I do think for them, um, NFTs serve more value as like access tokens or community tokens or governance tokens versus um, art that can change, if that makes sense. Um, I still do see the the artwork being very valuable because things have to be visually appealing for people to want to buy them. You're not going to want to buy. I mean, some projects lately have, uh, you know, <laughs> circumnavigated that uh, statement. But, uh, you know, generally speaking, you want to buy aesthetically pleasing things. So even if it is an access token, like I think a great example is like those meta keys, um, where you see like this beautiful 3D key like rotating through the air and then it gives you access to something. Okay, that's like obvious utility, even if somebody doesn't understand NFTs fully. Okay, the key gives me access to something. That that adds up, that makes sense. So I feel like um, pushing the utility, push, pushing the use case for companies makes it more of a no brainer for them, if that makes sense. Um, because they wanna give their fans access to these things and they've, and they've done things in the past like gated links, um, like, you know, three deferred links that reroute to different links that they can give people private information. But NFTs are really just the next stage in uh, this kind of complicated tech process of giving people like private information or exclusive information. And that, so that's really interesting. One of the things that you said as you were explaining about the difference between, you know, kind of the individual creators and the new up and coming folks like Board Ape and the MBA and those established brands. I wonder if that's maybe the, you know, part of the difference is that having a very strongly established legacy type brand, they historically have been very opposed to having derivatives because, you know, I mean, you think about it, like big companies have whole branding departments where you, know, you have brand standards in terms of even how much spacing needs to be around the logo. So they have like everything that, copyrighted, everything trademarked, like every little eccentricity of their brand. Yeah, That's always been a thing. Yeah. I'm curious what we're going to see as the Web3 space evolves. If the people who start off, you know, with these kind of, you know, community-based projects, as they create those brands within the space, I wonder if it will start to kind of skew more conservative as well. Yeah, I do definitely see that as a, as a possibility. I also do see like that we're still establishing like our visual identity in this space. Like there is no like this is what the NFT or DeFi space looks like right now. Like there's no like bottom line. I'd say there's a lot of um, trends. And that's part of what I started looking at when I came into the space, like looking at it as like a trend forecast. And um, OK, so we see a lot of 3D, obviously. We see a lot of Chrome, a lot of Shining, a lot of uh, interactivity, um, modularity, like in web design, like UI, UX, like things that um, are interactive. Um, so I do see a, sh a necessary shift that needs to happen when companies enter this space in order to feel native. Because if you're on even like an OpenSea or even like a Rarible or one of these larger marketplaces, your piece has to, even if it's different from everything else, it still does have to fit into this space. So like, for instance, when I was doing this drop for French Montana, they couldn't just put the shoes that they made on a pivot and show them. They had to create 3D models of these shoes in order to make it native um, for this audience. So I think it's interesting and it's definitely a conversation. It's definitely not their first intent either. Um, when they're going to the space, they're like, okay, here's our branding guides, let's do it. 
And it's like, well, sure, but you know, it has to fit within the ecosystem and it has to um, be something that doesn't stick out in a negative way. So I think that's interesting and it's a larger conversation, but yeah, the, the, the aesthetics of the space are definitely still being defined. And I think companies are gonna have to do something in order to um, shift their perception or shift their branding uh, to fit. Gonna end up with even more comprehensive branding guides for the metaverse. Our web three branding guide. Uh, <laughs> yes. That's a very interesting thing because then it ends up creating more roles that like never existed before. Like we've created an entire new industry and so many different roles. It's people. true though, because like NFT projects are also very unique because um, it's taking a lot, like they they take a lot of elements from different previous projects. And I noticed this because I came from the traditional like uh, entertainment industry. Um, so like there's a ton of like micro sites are very popular. Like I've built more websites in the past, like with my partner, my partner is a web designer. Oh my goodness, sorry. My building's fire alarm decided to go off, um, but it's, a, it's just a test. It may not even go off. So we'll see if it does, I may go to my balcony, but okay. let's find out. So while we are waiting to learn okay. about the fire I think test. I think it stopped. Stop. Okay. okay. They just, I live in a new building. So sometimes they do like announcements and then don't have a fire alarm. So there's about a 10% chance that there should be a fire alarm now. Um, okay. What were we just talking, what were we just talking about? Web3, visual Web identity. Three and like, yeah, the visual identity and like the absolutely new and previously unheard of like roles that have been created for people. Yes. Like, Yeah. So like, like uh, now I remember what I was saying, like these microsites, like my partner is a photographer and a web designer. He's never made more websites than he has. Like we haven't made more. I do I do the copywriting. He does the web design. Um, and like we've done so many in the past few months because every project needs its own microsite and every project needs its own Discord server and every project needs its own, you know, community manager. Like there's all these roles that were they existed before, but they were definitely not needed as often as they are now. So I think that's also very interesting. Like we definitely are creating a whole new job economy. And like people who learn solidity two, three years ago are now like completely oh bush, you know, like they're, they're making a ton of money. So it's really awesome. Like people who um, adopted this a year or two ago are now like at the forefront of the space. So it's very cool. That has been super, super interesting watching that roll through as well. Let's see what else we have. Let's see and if you're, and if you're a Solidity developer, I'll just say this to anybody who's watching, if you're a Solidity developer, please feel free to hit me up. This is my, wait, where is it? This is my social media. I uh, always do validity okay. downs. <laughs> so, one second type. All right, I'm gonna post those in the chat for you, all your social links and Love your it. website. You. And that was like in the midst of typing those, so the timing was perfect. <laughs> no worries at all. Yeah, so we've got links to all of your socials there, which I find very interesting here. Having, you know, on your Instagram, you're an NFT evangelist, a culture producer, yes. and then you've got the editor and all of the different businesses that uh, you're involved in. <laughs> no, just a few, not all of them, but you do have a link tree. I do. So have yes. we can get um, there. NFT evangelist is a funny term because, like, I did not make that term up for myself, I um, but I took it. And I'm and I'm running with it. Um, when I started working for Superworld, um, which was only about a month or two ago, they wanted me to specifically come in as a consultant for NFTs, um, but they wanted to give me a fun title. So, like for instance, like Krista Kim is also working on Superworld. She's their global ambassador, but they wanted my role to be like very NFT centric. So they they like Krista and I were talking. She's like, "You're like an NFT evangelist." I'm like, "Should I call myself an NFT evangelist?" Like, but then I've been going with it, and it's been working, and I've been preaching the good word of NFTs. So I mean, it makes sense. <laughs> Yes, and that is like that's something that hasn't existed, you know, more than two or three years ago. Right. But it's a fun one that I've seen over the last at least couple of years, you know, as we've had people growing up in this space and you know, starting in projects. And this was one of the things that I saw in Crypto Kitties is people who started with Crypto Kitties then like took this as the starting point. We're like, okay, but what else can I do with it? And like, this is where we've seen so many people branch out in the space and create their own projects and right. their own platforms. And, you know, we have a lot of those folks in the whale community, which is just super interesting watching. I, I love seeing, uh, like I, I consider them almost like layer twos of projects or like forks of projects that people like, because that's the, that's the ethos of the space. If you like something, make your own version of it more or less. Like, yes. All of the swaps that we see, you know, all of these, like offshot uh, 10K projects. 
like obviously they're each inspired by another collection and that's good that's productive that's helping us i think move forwards um but i also do think that there's a level of necessity in like pushing further which i do see a lot of these companies doing like they'll learn how to do something by imitating you know imitation is, is awesome it's how people learn how to do things um but i always say like this is not just nfts this is just like my ethos is like a creative i say like you know great artists steal from a lot of different places so like if you just copy one person it'll be obvious that you copy that one person but if you copy 10 people you created something unique because those 10 things have never come together before and i think we're now starting to see more of that in the space where like yes they're taking reference from or alluding to other projects or being inspired by other projects but the actual excuse me the actual project itself is entirely unique and has never been done before and i think that's really exciting and that really is that's one of the things that i you know had noticed early on you know people taking their projects and they like the devs you know the people who are part of the community were taking their projects and like pulling out their contracts and going all right if i tweak this part what happens right. and like deploy you know deploying those onto the test nets and seeing like okay well it didn't do what i thought it was going to do so let me change something else like that sort of trial and error has helped evolve this space quite a bit as well oh, yeah. it's fun that you know we have the freedom to be able to poke at those you know very foundational aspects of the projects and and i think so many create. like it, people had to walk so that we can run you know like even the original cryptopunks contract like I mean, I'm sure a lot of people listening know the full story, but the fact that their contract refunded people for their CryptoPunks originally, and then they have to release a new contract, like that's that's how the space works. It's all brand new. We're all just figuring it out and trying. So it's being adaptive. It's being um, fluid and willing to experiment and roll with the punches, I guess. And that's like, you know, something that really is part of the ethos of the space, I think, which is awesome. It's amazing. Yeah. We had a, uh, a comment in the chat that you're, uh, conversation has given them the idea of calling derivative artworks fork work. Ah, I like so, that. I like that. That's, that's kind of that's fun cool. and thematic. I like that. Um, I won't coin it. You can keep it, but I like that. <laughs> we're sharing it. Yes. Uh, Open source. <laughs> what do we, somebody had asked also, um, if you're advocating for brands acquiring ENS for their companies and products, like yes. how, do, how do we feel about those? I like ENS uh, names. Like uh, I have a few. <laughs> um, I use like davidcash.eth if anybody wants to send me some ETH. Um, and I do recommend pretty much all of my clients get one. It's kind of a learning curve again for a lot of people because they don't see the necessity in it. Um, but once they have sent around their public key a few times, then I think they start to realize like, oh, that could save me some worry. <laughs> you know, like that can save me some typing or whatever. Um, but that being said, I do also see anytime it's a significant amount of money being transacted, I'm even paranoid and I still do, you know, put in my entire key just so that I'm safe. Um, yes. So, yeah, I mean, I like it. I like ENS. Um, I recommend I, I like if I'm going through the process of somebody buying a new domain, I send it to them as well. I, I'll usually like I'll recommend the clients get a dot com um, or a dot IO purely for SEO purposes. Um, and then I, I usually recommend that they get a secondary domain. Um, usually a dot crypto or something from unstoppable domains or an ENS and just have it root to their site. Um, and that's again, that kind of like CD five integration that like works, but it's a transitionary period. And I'd love to be able to say that in a few years, we wouldn't need that dot com um, affiliation, but I'd say right now where we are in the space, it still is helpful um, in terms of getting people to your site. Like, and if you're using the unstoppable domains and happen to have an animal in your name, then you get an NFT with it. So right, that's when I right. had one of those from like two years ago. Yes. Oh, I hope you claimed your free websites. Yes. Okay. Amazing. I got a few. I was very happy. And I was like, and I got some premium ones too. I'm like, no way. Like I got like the cash. Oh goodness. Now we have the fire alarm going off. So I'll let you ask your next question. Oh no. So. Actually, I was going to say, like, I don't know if there's anything that I have not asked yet today, but that you wanted to tell us about, because I know we're getting close to time, so I don't want to hold you all day, but I want to make sure that we're covering all of the amazing things that you were, like, super pumped to share with the whale community. Yes, absolutely. Is this super distracting, or should I go out onto my balcony? What I think that we'll be fine here. Okay, okay, amazing. And sorry for everybody in advance if you're wearing headphones. Um, so, a couple things that are coming up in the next few weeks. Um, I'd say first is this Friday, I believe, yes, this Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, um, here in Toronto, Canada. So if anybody happens to be in Canada or online, um, we're going to be launching a project uh, with Krista Kim. Um, it's called Continuum. 
It's being auctioned this week uh, through Sotheby's. Um, Steve Aoki curated a collection for Sotheby's. You may have seen some stuff online. Oh, thank God. They, they were nice mm -hmm. to me. Uh, you may have seen Steve Aoki curated some stuff um, for Sotheby's this past week being announced. Um, and my good friend um, and colleague Krista is part of that drop. Um, and she, as her piece, um, she likes to do it big. Uh, and I've definitely had a chance to help her with this project, um, producing it here in Toronto. Um, it's going to be the first um, piece of installation land art that's being sold as an NFT. So it's a hundred foot long screen um, that's actually about to go on a world tour. Um, it's a hundred foot long screen with this like animated installation, um, a meditative sound installation. And it's going to be live at Fort York, which is this, this large um, kind of music festival grounds here in Toronto, Toronto, Canada. And uh, it's open to the public. Um, Jeff Schroeder from the Smashing Pumpkins is going to be playing along with it. Um, and we have the mayor coming. It's gonna be a whole like uh, city cultural event. Um, and then it doesn't end there. She's also taking it around the world. So it's currently also up in Aranya, China. Um, it's going to be presented at Art Basel. So it's like, this is kind of the commencement of this world tour. Uh, and my partner and I had a chance to do the microsite for that and then some of the strategy and you know some of the copywriting. So it's like, it's really nice to see that finally come together. And I'm very excited to see it in person, um, like actually installed somewhere. So that's something I'm really excited about. Um, a lot of the stuff I'm doing right now is a little bit top secret because um, there are a few other sports teams. I never thought that I would be working in sports, but at the same time, like it's the it's really part of the pinnacle of the entertainment industry and like some of the things that happen in sports are I think some of the largest spectacles that we um, we get <laughs> as a as a North American society at least, also in Europe. Um, but we're working with a couple of very cool teams um, to do some more experiential NFT projects. That's something I'm very excited about. And then. What's else? What else? There's NFT NYC, which I'm very excited to be attending. Um, I'm going to be a speaker there. That was like a recent development. And then also Art Basel. Art, oh, this is what I just have to mention really quickly uh, for yes. anybody watching is that Art Basel 2021. You've heard it here first. You probably have heard of this already. But this is going to be a really historic event because it's the first major, from my perspective, the first major uh, traditional world art event that's going to be more or less taken over by NFTs. Um, and this is the first Basel where NFTs have really been prevalent. And I really see that this year, I, I mean, I'm... I have the privilege of working on about five or six projects currently happening at Basel right now uh, with a bunch of awesome people. But without giving away too many details, you're not going to want to miss uh, Miami Basel this year, even if you're just watching along remotely. Um, that's also something I will say um, as well. Coming out of the pandemic and coming out of this period, I'd say all live events, at least from my perspective, will have a digital component. So for instance, Continuum, we're streaming live around the world. And we have some media partners who are facilitating that. Um, Basel, a lot of the big installations and events that we have going on will also be streamed online. Um, and I think that's also a, like another example of us uh, transitioning into this new world um, as we've gotten so comfortable being at home and being able to do stuff like this. So, yes. and here we go again. So oh, no. it's a great day. <laughs> yes. Well, I know that you got the fire alarm going in it, and I am so excited about all the things that you've shared and the contributions that you've made to the space so far, but I know that you know, this is just the beginning. And so being able to follow along with you, um, we've got everybody's, I'm going to find your social links and we'll share those again Thank to you. make sure that everybody is following along because you I've, are I've fallen like back in love with Twitter. I was like very much the kid who used to like live tweet the Oscars. So now back in the NFT space, I'm like getting back into it. Um, oh, but Insta Instagram is also a really good way to keep up with what I'm doing. Um, I post stories pretty regularly. Um, and yeah, I'd say like if you if you are interested at all in um, reaching out um, that, yeah. And again, here we go. <laughs> it's it's just a constant test. Um, so, yeah, if, if you're interested in reaching out, um, you can you can check out my website, cashlabs.io. Again, we have an onboarding document on there and you can also find my email there, which is just david at cashlabs.io uh, if you want to reach out. Um, and yeah, I, I appreciate you guys uh, having me here. This is really awesome and i apologize for the noise in the background but uh hopefully oh. that ends soon as well <laughs> yes i hope it ends soon for you too because fire alarms even when they're at tests are no fun uh, but we appreciate you coming and hanging out with us today and sharing your journey and a lot of these amazing um accomplishments that you've been able to be a part of so far but also the exciting peaks into the future because that is Oh my goodness, like we're excited about just what you shared. And I saw the community reacting very positively to a lot of the things that you were saying during the chat. You're kind of explaining, you know, the onboarding processes, explaining a lot of the, you know, the struggles perhaps and kind of helping 
bring the metaverse to the mainstream. So that's the goal. Um, yes. Last thing I'll plug also because the fire alarm finally stopped. So that's lovely. Um, I didn't realize it was this week, but I just checked my calendar and it is. Um, the next talk I'm having with a university um, is actually a Canadian university. It's Queen's University. And it's going to be streamed live online. So if anybody is interested in checking out my social media, you'll see I did a post on my Instagram about it. But that's going to be happening on the 30th, which I believe is this Thursday, if I'm not mistaken. So um, this Thursday at, I think, seven, 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, um, I'm going to be doing a live lecture on like introducing NFTs. So if you know anybody who needs that intro, <laughs> there we go. Thank you. Um, if you know anybody who needs that intro, uh, please feel free to send them my way. Um, this is the next in a long series of lectures that I'm trying to do. Um, to push. And I look so good in that photo and you can see how much I've aged since the past couple of years. But uh, yeah, that, that's something I'm looking forward to a lot. Only um, getting better with time. That's all. <laughs> I appreciate it. But yeah, I hope, uh, hope to see some of you there. Uh, if you know, or I mean, I feel like this is very much an insider community, but if you know anybody who needs an onboarding, uh, we're going to be doing this one on mass. So uh, looking forward to that. Bring your friends, but also come because there's always more to learn. Just the nuances. I would love some educated questions being asked in the thing, because I'm sure that a lot of people are going to be like, I feel like the whole conversation is going to be about why they're not bad for the environment and everybody thinks they are. So that's a, a oh, whole other spiel. <laughs> that topic has been yes. a big one, hasn't it? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I have, a, I have a whole rant. So we can save that for Thursday. But if you want to catch that, um, Thursday, 6 to 7 Eastern Standard. Perfect. Time. There's the hook. We're ready now. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, David, thank you so, so much for your time today for joining the whale community for this episode of the Metaverse Makers, Movers and Shakers. We will follow up with your social media. We'll follow up with your uh, lecture here on Thursday. And in the event that you have more exciting projects to release and want to come back and share them with us, we are always open to that. Oh, I would love to. I would love to. You're lovely and uh, a big fan of Whale Shark in this community that he's built. I think this is really awesome. And uh, you guys are in the center of this world. So, I mean, like, I appreciate you listening to me, little old me talking about this stuff. But, uh, and here we go again. Yeah, off to, off to a good start to our day. <laughs> All right. Well, we will end the stream for now. We will make sure that we get the recording up so that way folks who perhaps missed it will be able to follow up and we will be in touch soon. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you again. Appreciate your time.